All right, guys, we are going to get underway. Looks like we got most of our uh, attendees on, so we are going to get this thing rocking. My name is Noah Metzger, and I will be your uh, host for the webinar for these uh, three sessions. Um, and I am one of the reps at Inside Sales here at Entertech, so if you guys call in looking for us or got questions or you need to get connected to the parts department or tech service, uh, I might be one of the guys on the phone. Our presenter today is Mr. Paul Bagno from uh, EGIA. He is one of their contract uh, development guys. Uh, give us a stunning webinar series to listen to. So uh, obviously we have our time today, and then we will continue tomorrow, uh, same time, 9 o'clock. It will be another half-hour session, and then we will take a couple-day break and come back on August 2nd, again at 9 o'clock, to finish this webinar series up. Uh, we are going to submit questions. Uh, you can do that during uh, the course of the webinar, but we will wait until the end of each session uh, to answer those questions. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So, Paul, I'm going to switch the screens over to you so you can get going. Okay, can you hear me all right, Noah? You can. <clears throat> Perfect. All right, and then let me know when you can see my screen. Um, are we there? Let's see. No one can see you. Don't want that. There we go. That should do the screen sharing. So do we have that uh, first slide up? We are good. All right. I'm going to minimize this little guy so it's not in the way. Well, good morning, and hopefully it's a beautiful day wherever all of you folks are. I uh, always love doing these uh, webcasts. Today is day one of a three-day series. Um, we'll finish up next week. And this is, uh, for those of you who attended um, the Intertech dealer meeting, uh, the, the request to do this webcast came out of that event, and the goal was to have more time to get into some of the details of uh, the this important topic of financing. Um, we will never have enough time to answer all of your questions, so please make a note that, uh, and I'll have my information up at the end of each day, uh, to send me an email, uh, pick up the phone, and we're here to make sure that you have all the questions you need and as much detail as you need. And the intent is, after you've seen today's presentation and the next two presentations, uh, to bring in your key staff, uh, because the more this, this is disseminated into your organizations, the quicker uh, you'll see success. So with uh, the computer will cooperate here. There we go. Uh, just a quick discussion on who EGIA is. We are a nonprofit contractor association uh, located in, Color in California. I happen to live in Colorado. EGIA has been helping contractors sell appliances since uh, appliances were invented, basically. And about 18 years ago, EGIA uh, was approached by the Department of Energy trying to figure out how to make more efficient appliances available to the marketplace. They identified back then that one of the barriers was higher first cost. So EGIA partnered with GE Capital on behalf of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and launched some of the first uh, commer commercial funded uh, residential financing programs in the country. Um, and this financing is different than bank financing in that you don't have to go to the bank. And I'll tell you in 17 years, it's really become an amazing streamlined process. And almost a billion dollars worth of loan partners um, Use, find, provide financing to EGI's contractors. EGI is not a bank. It's not our money. We just bring best-of-class financing companies to our best-of-class contractor membership base. So we're going to go over uh, three different topics over the next three days. Today is just getting in your head why you should be offering financing. Um, and hopefully, if I don't succeed in day one, then I probably won't see you day two or day three unless you're curious. But we're going to really focus today on, on just how important it is to offer all of your customers financing at every sale. 
Day two, I call that dealer math. We're going to get into how easy it is to offer your products and services using finance and how to calculate uh, the customer payments and how to present um, that information. And then day three, the capstone day, is going to be taking the information from days one and two and putting that into a, a sales proposal and a sales discussion for your customers. And once you get through that hurdle, you're going to find uh, your sales will go up, your margins will go up, and it really isn't uh, that hard of a process. So why is financing a key to growth? It's very simple, and I hate to say it, but uh, there are two barriers to the geothermal industry. One, uh, we're running out of customers who can afford to pay cash for geothermal. And two, and I, I try to dance around this, but today I'm not going to, I think there's just a stubborn contractor base out there that, now think about this, geothermal, and I've been in the industry for 20 some years, has always gone to higher income, um, usually folks with a higher up sort of the education curve. A lot of our customers are what we call uh, big fish, little ponds, right? So the folks who own the hardware store, or the auto dealership, or our big farms and ranches. And so we have always sold to customers who have cash. And so it makes sense that if uh, you don't ever remember your customer needing financing, your assumption would be that all of your customers know how to pay for geo. When I was a contractor, I never thought about where my customers got their money from. Unfortunately, um, I'm going to show some, some, I call them the dismal statistics. There are still folks out there who can write a check for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 without blinking, and those are still very loyal geothermal buyers. But what we're missing are the customers who can't write that big check. And I'm going to show you that the percentage of um, the folks who can write the big check to the percentage of folks who would love geothermal if they didn't have to write a big check is changing and it's skewing more towards the people who need financing to buy your product. So I like to look at this as a, the iceberg dilemma. Uh, as contractors, we see the customers that we've always dealt with that are the, you know, the folks that have the money and they want the product and they're knowledgeable about it. But two thirds of the iceberg, the part that we can't see, those are the folks that for whatever reason, they would like geothermal, and there's lots of reasons to want to have a geothermal system, but they just don't have the cash to buy a system. Those are the customers that financing goes after, the ones you really can't see. So I like to say that you know the Titanic got in trouble because it hit the part of the iceberg that it couldn't see. Um, I think the geothermal industry will really grow if it can just focus on those folks that would buy geothermal if they knew it was affordable. And so the purpose of these next three days is to show you how affordable geothermal is for customers who don't have the cash to write a check for their system. So the uh, this is DOE data. I did some research on how long ago did people pay cash for stuff. So. Um, those of you who have kids <laughs> may remember watching uh, the Pixar movie or watching your first episode of Survivor. Um, and those of you who are younger in the audience, you may remember watching those as kids, right? So it's been a long time since this survey was undertaken, 2001, so 16 years ago. So that is a long time in, uh, in the consumer marketplace. But 16 years ago, back in 2001, most home improvements were done by cash buyers. 63% of home improvements, people paid cash. And personal loans, which are the type of loans we're going to talk about in the next couple of days, only accounted for 4% of home improvements. So if you were starting your business back then, uh, I don't blame you for thinking that your customers have cash because, uh, you know, that long ago, 16, 17 years ago, customers did have cash. But now let's look at some other statistics. So the DOE studies on that on that chart there um, kind of is the pink line, and we really had a cash market for a lot of goods um, from for back in the day. And the little dots going up the hill that was the historic residential geothermal sales. Okay, so we were selling about forty thousand units back uh, when that DOE study was done. Um, then we had the Great Recession of 2008, and, the, and right at about the same time, and I'll share this in another slide, we also got the geothermal tax credits. 
So the geothermal industry really kind of started taking off in 2006, had a great run until about 2009, um, driven more by fossil fuel prices, I think, than financial inst instruments or um, tax credits, okay? But another fundamental thing happened after that Great Recession. Um, it really was a, a inflection point where consumers became what I call payment buyers. That was really the great watershed, and I'll show you another slide here in a second, where our economy switched from people, there were still a lot of folks paying cash for the sofa, paying cash for the car, paying cash for their geothermal system, and we really became a nation of payment buyers, and that great recession really helped drive us to that. So here's the, the other way to slice deeper into that information. So all of us fit into some category by the demographers or the economists, right? So the silent generation, the folks who fought World War II, they're now in their 70s and, and late 80s and early 90s. Now those folks came home from World War II. Uh, they, after a couple of years when the economy took off, they got great jobs with big companies, they got pensions, they got health care for life. They bought a lot of ground source heat pumps. And if you look at this chart, the silent generation only uh, just a little over 50% of them report having any debt, and that was in 2014, okay? So they have the least amount of carry-forward debt of any generation uh, in the U.S. population. Following the, the silent generation were the boomers. Um, so the boomers are now in their 50s, and they're starting to push their 70s. Um, so the boomers... The early boomers kind of got the same ride that the silent generation had. They also came into a good economy, but by about 1967, 69, that we started going through some economic turmoils. We had the OPEC oil shocks. So the baby boomers basically uh, ran out of the opportunity to save cash. So right now, 80% of boomer families report carrying debt. And so the, the inclination is you may have debt and you may have savings, but the higher your debt, the, the less opportunity there is for you to have savings, right? And then we take their, the early boomers kids, the Gen Xers, and basically they're coming into the world with an average of $88,000 in debt. And they're, in, they're young people. They're in their 30s, right? So they have more debt than their parents. The odds of them having a big cash nut, the, the percentage of those folks that have a big cash nut is even smaller than their parents were. And then we have the millennials who are carrying a little less debt, but that's probably because, and it's a sad statistic, many, many, many millennials are still living at home. They haven't even had a chance to launch their careers. So if you look at that chart, we were, if we were selling to the silent generation as they retired and they had pensions and they had cash and they were buying that dream house in the country, the market for folks that have cash is only going to decline as we go forward. And advance, there we go. And here's, here's the... Here's the reality today. 50% of U.S. consumers said they would find it difficult to write a check for $2,000 for a major refer purchase, so the refrigerator blew up, or the transmission broke in the car. So if half the consumers out there can't spend $2,000, what percentage are going to be able to spend twenty, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000 for a geothermal system? They just don't have the cash like they used to. And then the average savings of median income households, right, median income, not the high end, not the low end, the average savings of median income households is $3,800. So if you only have $3,800 and you're an average household, uh, you're not going to be inclined to put a geothermal system on your credit card or uh, tap your $3,800. You're probably not inclined to get a new air conditioner. You're, you'll replace the compressor. And then, not to beat a dead horse, but I think it's just important for you to get this into your mind, 62% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account. Only 14% of Americans have a savings balance of over $10,000. And so that's why geothermal is maybe 1% of the HVAC market in the U.S. Uh, to look at it another way, and this takes that same data and converts it back to the age groups again, uh, the younger millennials are in their 20s now, their mid-20s, uh, less than about 7% of them report having savings of 10000 or more. 
Uh, the older millennials that are in their 30s and having families, they report 12% of them report having $10,000. And then you can see as we get up into the, the silent generation and the baby boomers, it still peaks at, at maybe 20%. And the folks, the seniors are just not buying and retrofitting houses anymore. They, you know, they're actually downsizing and moving into, into different living conditions where they're closer to their kids. So that, that high end of the scale, that's the most of the market you're going to get that has uh, ten thousand dollars or more in savings. So if you want to want to increase your geothermal sales, you need to move down the curve to where there's people who can afford the product and want the product but don't have the cash. And uh, again, this is a really important statistic from the National Home Builders. I'm hoping they'll update this. This data was from two thousand survey in 2015, so I hope they do another survey this year. 50% of all home improvements over $5,000 are financed. So as a contractor, look in the mirror and go talk to your office manager, your bookkeeper, and say, how many of my sales are financed? And if it, the number isn't 50% or more, I will tell you you're leaving business on the sidelines so it's either going to your competitor, going to another product, or going uh, just going un unused because customers would have bought a new system from you, but they opted for a repair instead. So these, if you're in business, and I just want to say this one more time because it's so important, if you're in business, you should be financing 50% of more of everything you do by offering financing, and that's how you know you've optimized uh, your sales and marketing budgets to drive income for your business. And that's driven by the simple fact that homeowners have great credit. About 80% of the families out there uh, have credit scores and equity positions in their homes that will let them take advantage of the products we're going to talk about today. So there's a big market for folks who can get signature loan financing for good quality products if you make it available to them. And the auto industry proves that. Uh, the auto industry took it on the chin in 2006 and 2007. People didn't quit buying cars because they didn't want cars. They quit buying cars because the financial markets locked up and they couldn't get financing. So uh, we have had record car sales now that the recession is behind us. The prices of cars have gone up. 85% of all car sales are financed primarily at the dealership lot. You know, people people go see the finance manager at the lot rather than go down to the credit union and negotiate and do all that stuff because why? The financing guy at the lot makes it quick. You can have your financing approval on the lot while you're looking at the car that you want to buy and you don't have to take time out of your day to go see somebody else. These uh, financing programs for geothermal are the exact same way. You can get a credit decision while you're showing the customer your presentation. Um, so, and because cars have gotten more and more expensive, the auto dealers don't let that bother them. They just went straight to longer loans. So they figured out that rates and terms are important. So that's what we've done, and I'm going to talk to you about the uh, auto loan or the geothermal loans we've put together that now go out to terms that match the life of the equipment, and that makes them affordable. So I've heard a lot of people tell me, yeah, financing doesn't work. My customers don't need financing. Let me just share another industry that, that did not take that approach, the residential solar market. Uh, as you know, they have a 30% federal tax credit. They got their tax credit a couple years before geothermal. And the chart on the left, the little red arrow, shows when the residential solar tax credit took a place. And you can see four or five years went by, and it didn't make any difference in the residential market. And then suddenly they had this huge explosion. Well, here's the geothermal market. Here's when we got our tax credits, and we saw a little spike, and now we're falling off the charts. So what's the difference between two industries? Both had the same tax credit. Geothermal provides a better cash flow than solar. Why did solar explode and geothermal just not? Well, we were selling about 40,000 units a year when the solar residential solar market started. And they were saying, hey, we're going to charge as much as a ground source heat pump, and we'll sell more than you do. And we thought that was pretty cute. Well, guess what? They were right. We were wrong. Um, in 2008, a couple of companies, starting with Solar City, started 
financing solar, right, with financial instruments. They converted, they call it solar as a service. Make a monthly payment, get your PV. Shortly thereafter, about four or five players came into the market with different financing, and the rest is history. They've never looked back. They've been running 50% or more back-to-back, year-to-year growth. Geothermal industry, same tax credit, no change. You know, a little bump, and then we're drifting back to below where we were when the tax credits came online. The difference is solar office signature financing, geothermal does not. And just to kind of show you the math, I live in Colorado, so I use Denver. If any of you are curious, I can do this in your home state. Um, a 4KW system, solar with tax credits in Colorado, has a simple payback after the tax credits of about 14 years. A very a nice, probably overpriced geothermal system in Denver uh, has the same payback, even though it doesn't have, have tax credits. It's not about the payback. It's it's about the ease of saying yes to the contract, okay? And we're going to do an exercise tomorrow where we're going to talk about how much savings your geothermal does, and I will show you that if you're selling against propane or fuel oil, the odds are pretty good you can put geothermal system into somebody's house and they can actually have a positive cash flow, okay? And this is the business cycle. This is why I hope you're all on the call and the webinar today. If you start offering financing, your salesman's going to be pleased, your salespersons are going to be pleased because their closing ratios are going to go up, provided you reach out to the customers that you haven't been talking to before. So how do you do that? Um, you start advertising to let people know that geothermal is now affordable, okay? And now you're selling more geothermal, which has more margin per job, more revenue per labor hour invested. And then take some of that increased margin, put it back into your advertising budget, and that's how you uh, get to that 50% or more of your sales close with financing. So financing can't live under a box. You have to let people know it's available from the first time they call your office to schedule an appointment to the last presentation by the salesperson. You have to make it part of your DNA, I like to say, and you will grow up this wheel, and we see it time and time and time again at EGI, and we've worked with tens of thousands of contractors. Companies can double and triple their annual sales if they just start using financing, offering it to every customer every time, and promoting its availability and affordability in their advertising. So it's, it's a very simple, easy-to-follow formula. So... We surveyed our really high-end salespeople, closers that were at $2 million plus a year, and these are their statistics. They don't sell 50% of their jobs with financing. They sell 60 to 70% of their jobs with financing. Uh, their closing ratios are 25% higher than their non-high-performing high, uh, peers, and their projects, their ticket sizes are 20 to 30% larger. Now think about that one for a second. If you're offering financing and you're at a monthly payment that provides a customer a positive cash flow, how much harder is it to add on an air purifier or you know another uh, any other system that you might want to put into your system, a, a fancier system, upgrade, well, these superheaters are pretty much standard now, but uh, a, a higher efficiency unit, um, all of those kinds of things. So once things become affordable, people are willing to buy up until their budget. And so financing lets you sell bigger projects, higher margins, higher closing ratios. That's what drives profitability for your dealership and your company, okay? So let's just look at a, a simple example. Uh, hopefully some of you are, will, will prove this to yourselves. Well, let's just say you, you're making three sales calls a month. Uh, you've got a, a pretty you know, pretty fair closing ratio. One out of the three people you talk to buy the geothermal that you're proposing three times a month. Your average sale is a $30,000 system, and that's bringing in an annual revenue of $360,000 on your geo business. Okay, not too bad. Uh, you have to tell me what your margins are on that 360, but um, it could be, you know, bringing in $80,000, $90,000 to your business. Well, now, let's just say you start offering financing to every customer every time, and you started telling people that geothermal could be financed. So you pick up two more sales calls, two more leads a month, okay? So that looks like a big percentage jump, but it's only two more sales calls. 
And let's just say your sales closing ratio goes from one, you know, one out of three to every other person takes the financing. So you get a 50% sales close. Don't change the ticket on your geothermal. Well, suddenly you're selling $900,000 worth of geothermal, and all you did was start offering financing and promoting the fact that financing was available to your geothermal customers. Okay, And again, we see that 200, 250% growth curve all the time. So I'm studying this, and I'm like, what is the problem here? Well, I've decided that, and I, I shouldn't say this, but I will. The solar guys really were selling an expensive product, didn't have much of a cash flow, didn't really generate much revenue at all. And they knew that they had to make it easy for customers to say yes so they wouldn't sell, sell anything. So they really weren't afraid to offer financing. They're like the little boy on the right. And they're thinking, they're not thinking about anything that could go wrong. They're just thinking how fun this is going to be when they launch off that, uh, that dock into the water. The geothermal contractors, and I work with contractors across all industries, I just don't get why the geothermal contractors are the, the last group to offer financing. I just can't say it any other way. So uh, caution, <laughs> too cautious is a word, and I almost put the put a chicken on here, but I, I chickened out, uh, that's a pun. But I, for whatever reason, geothermal contractors are the most resistant group to offering financing, so I'm just here to help break down that barrier, okay? So Einstein says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, here, this little red arrow I put on the historic chart, uh, I'm on the ICSPA board, and I still can't get decent uh, industry sales for geothermal because uh, the feds quit reporting, and I'm still trying to find out the number. But I would not be surprised if this year doesn't close back to where we were back in, like, 19 or, yeah, in 06 or 07, right? So our sales have peaked. Uh, the tax credits ended, the bottom's coming out of the market, and we're all saying, whoa, what's going on? And I say it's, it's simple. Tax credits aren't essential. Making geothermal affordable is essential. So it's time to change how we go to market and start offering financing. And I'm happy to report that I did a really deep dive. Uh, I checked the leading causes of death of Americans and offering financing to contactors didn't even, didn't even make the list. So now I'm going to try to fine tune the uh, dealer search and see if I can find any dealer who, uh, who became the, <laughs> the subject of a country western song because they started offering financing and consequently lost their truck, their dog, their wife, or their house. Um, so financing can only help your business, and I'm, I'm just trying to present that in a, in, a, in a humorous way because it's so important for you to understand you've got to change the way you're doing financing or you're not going to change your, your geothermal sales, okay? So that um, is the importance of, of financing. Hopefully, I've uh, piqued your interest so that you'll come back for the second class, which is getting into the dealer math. And with that, I am ready to take any questions in the about four or five minutes we have left. Anybody out there? So Noah, how did you want to take the questions? Are you going to be the moderator? Uh, yeah, are you going to unmute? I'll be, yeah, I'll be the moderator <laughs> here. We don't have a current question, but it is more of a compliment for you, Paul. One of the listeners said, uh, not a question, but great presentation. All right. Well, thank you. Tomorrow's going to be even better. <laughs> so, and then uh, we had we had a chat this morning. Um, we're going to try to uh, the, these half hour windows are great, but they don't give us a lot of time. We're going to try to walk you through an exercise, and we may be asked, sending you all an email for for you to send us in some homework assignments between now and tomorrow. So, um, but with that, I'll hang out until you guys turn off the call. Uh, hopefully, folks are mulling this over and. Uh, oh, yeah. We do have one question here, Paul. It says, uh, do you present every sale as monthly payments with no cash price? 
Um, well, what I would we pre recommend is, and I'll show this to you in day three, how I would do the sales pitch, and it's really a soft close. You save your cash price as you're in your back pocket. And the way I would we teach contractors to say this is, um, Mr. or Mrs. Jones, uh, I've reviewed your options. I can put you into a blah, blah, blah system uh, for uh, $194 a month. Um, or if you'd like to just take some time uh, to, to get your finances together, we can give you a, a, a no payments, no interest program for up to 12 or 24 months. And which of those would you prefer? The customer then says, gosh, I was planning on writing a check. Then you can say, you, that puts you in the, in the seat, and we'll talk about this again tomorrow. You can say, oh, well, if you'd like to, if you'd like to pay for the system up front, uh, let me talk to the boss. But I think we can, I think we, if you write me a check by Wednesday, I could probably get the boss to knock X dollars off of this proposal. So you can't line item your dealer fees, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, but you can offer a cash discount, right? Uh, don't lead with a cash discount. Just have it in your back pocket. Most customers, and this is the hardest thing for dealers to understand, most customers are waiting to know what the payment is. They're not waiting to know what the cash discount is because they don't think they, they know they don't have the cash anyway. That that one out of 20 customers that does have the cash, most of them are going to ask you what the cash discount is because they've always asked for it because they're one of the few folks that has it. So just be ready to answer that question. Don't lead with it. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we had a request to put up your contact info again. Can you throw that screen back up there real quick? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I missed that click. I'm sorry. There we go. You got that? Hey, Paul, this is Kyle. Another one I just had a dealer ask me the other day that we didn't have a lot of time to talk through, but maybe you can help coach me a little bit. Um, I had a dealer come up to me, or talk to me on the phone, rather, and, um, and in Illinois, and he said that people in their area just don't want or need financing, and uh, that their customers just simply don't use it. And I was just kind of taken back a little bit, I guess, by that, and I, I was a little nervous to put everybody into that stereotype. Well, and so I, there are, I mean, there are pockets, right? And, but to say that everybody in a community doesn't need financing um, would be a statistical admirality, right? It's just not common. And a lot of that is cultural, and and blessed, I you know Dave Ramsey. I love listening to the Dave Ramsey show that says get out of the debt and and whatnot. But the statistics say that you know eighty percent of potential customers are going to want to take financing. Now let me let me put it to you another way though. Um, I had an ex boss. Uh, he's retired now. He was a very wealthy man. Uh, I was given this presentation. Uh, and he was in the room, and afterwards he came up to me and he said, you know, I just bought a new car. And he didn't buy uh, cheap cars, right? And he bought a new car every year. And he said, I go, yeah. And he said, I took the financing. And I kind of blinked. I'm like, you did? He said, yeah. I figured I could make more money uh, keeping my money in the market than, than their financing was going to cost me. So just don't assume, and that's the first slide I'm going to start with on the third day. If you get into the habit of offering financing every time, and every if, if every day, day after day after day after day, your customers say, I don't need financing, and, and you've been advertising financing, then fine, quit offering it. But I think what you're going to find is you're just talking to the same people that didn't need financing for the last 30 years. So don't be afraid to try it, and don't be afraid to market to people because there is a bias out there, and I know this uh, for a fact because I've lived through it. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to customers who said, when I win the lottery, you know, when I inherit some money from my rich Uncle Fred, I'm going to put geothermal in my house. And they, they're thinking they can't afford it now, and they sure wish they could afford it someday. Well, when we go through our presentation tomorrow, uh, you don't have to save much on utility bills 
to show geothermal has a positive cash flow. And I will guarantee you if you offer financing on all of your products and you give people a, a and this is kind of a teaser for tomorrow, a good, better, best scenario, it's really hard for geothermal to not look like the most affordable option. So I, I hear that occasionally too. My, my gut instinct, quite frankly, Kyle, is let me come, let me come spend a week with you, right? You put, up, you put up the hotel room and the airfare, I'll show up for a week and let's just go on some sales calls and see what this is all about. And four, as long as you're buying dinner. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go in the field for cheap. I just don't you know don't like driving two thousand miles to get there. <laughs> but seriously, you guys get. I just I just don't believe that. I I believe that the contractor's correct. I just think he's talking to the same people over and over again and hasn't reached into a deeper market. I agree too. Um, well, no, you can close out. Yeah. All right. I think uh, that's all the questions we got. For today, thanks, uh, Paul, for your great presentation again. Um, and we will be back at the same bat time, same bat channel tomorrow. Um, so that being 9 central, by the way. Uh, so adjust your clocks accordingly. Um, yeah, thanks for attending, guys and gals. We will see you tomorrow. Okay, thanks, everybody.